This podcast discusses rape revenge films and goes into explicit detail about sexual assault and violence. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to I Spit on Your Rape Revenge Film, a podcast that explores rape revenge films from the early 70s exploitation era to the post hashtag MeToo movement. I'm Mimi. I'm Alex. I'm Cecily. And I'm Alessia. And in today's episode, we will be talking about the representation of victims and methods of justice. The films we'll be analysing are I Spit on Your Grave, Promising Young Woman, Revenge, and Violation. Take off your clothes. I don't like women giving me orders. I spit on your grave. Mayor Zarchi's I Spit on Your Grave is widely regarded as a seminal text in rape revenge cinema. Before sparking a series of post-feminist remakes in the 2010s, the original 1978 film was characterised by its uncensored and highly sexualised rape scenes, dubbing it a product of the sexploitation era in cinema, which rose in popularity during the sexual revolution of the 1970s. The film follows Jennifer, a writer for a women's magazine based in New York, as she leaves the city and travels to a small town in Louisiana for a summer of solitude as she writes her novel. During this time, she is stalked, harassed, sexually assaulted, and eventually left for dead at the hands of four local men, Johnny, Stanley, Matthew, and Andy. After surviving the brutal assault, the third act of the film is devoted to Jennifer's revenge as she plots the elaborate deaths of her attackers and carries them out successfully, which includes luring two men to their deaths with the promise of sex, strangling one with a rope, cutting one's penis off and leaving him to bleed out in her bathtub, and running the other two over with a speedboat. To understand the significance behind Zarchi's graphic filmography, it's important to take a look at what the social climate was like during the late 60s and early 70s during the sexual revolution. In 1973, a precedent was set in the Supreme Court in Miller v. California, which allowed sexual references in the media to be protected under the First Amendment, as long as they held serious literary, artistic, political or scientific value. This ruling paved the way for the mainstream distribution of sexploitation films during the 70s. It also invited filmmakers to push the boundaries in terms of the kinds of sex they showed in their films. These kinds of rulings are an example of Eric Schaefer's definition of the sexual revolution, which he argues was not simply a collective spontaneous interest in sexuality, but rather a renewed interest in sexuality that allowed it to begin its transition into the public realm via mass media, after being confined to the reproductive realm for much of modern history. I Spit on Your Grave was released in the midst of this cultural upheaval in 1978, and after watching the film, it is clear that Zarchi took advantage of the shifting cultural tides that allowed liberalisation of sexual content. The way Zarchi took inspiration from sexploitation cinema in the creation of his rape revenge classic was a major grievance for audiences and critics alike following its release. Renowned film critic Roger Ebert described attending I Spit on Your Grave as one of the most depressing experiences of his life, which is a perspective that is echoed in Marsha Porter and Mick Martin's review of the film, who described it as one of the most tasteless, irresponsible and disturbing movies ever made. Despite leaving audiences unsettled, this film was described by David Maguire as the ground zero of rape revenge cinema. I Spit on Your Grave was not the first rape revenge film, but it was the one that has stood the test of time. And whether we care to admit it or not, the violence of I Spit on Your Grave is a source of fascination for audiences and is something that has become a staple in rape revenge cinema. The main question on everyone's mind when this film was released was whether this film was feminist or not. As stated by Zarchi on multiple occasions, he always intended for this film to carry feminist sentiment and was in fact inspired by a real-life interaction between Zarchi and the woman he found abandoned in Central Park immediately after her sexual assault in 1974. Sarchi's depiction of Jennifer as a force to be reckoned with marks a shift in the way victimhood had been portrayed in the media up until this point. As highlighted by Loni Howes, second wave feminism was heavily invested in grassroots activism and rape advocacy was one of the main focuses of these efforts. These movements granted victims a platform for their voices to be heard as well as a community who understood their rage and the portrayal of Jennifer as a survivor rather than a victim is reminiscent of these sentiments. From a radical feminist point of view, I can see how the valorization of female rage in I Spit on Your Grave could be deemed revolutionary. 
As rage is typically coded masculine, seeing Jennifer's unfettered anger bubble to the surface through her acts of vengeance is an act of gender transgression. In the days following her attack, we watch Jennifer as she rebuilds herself. We watch as she washes the blood off her body and sits in her lake house in silence as she plots the deaths of her attackers until she emerges clothed in all white, ready to carry out her deeds. As an audience, we are with Jennifer from rebuild to rebirth, and the emotional proximity we feel towards her leads us to justify, and perhaps for some, to rejoice in her violent reclamation of power. However, I think these possible readings of female empowerment are negated by the way this film was distributed and the ways in which audiences consumed this content. David Maguire explains that despite the intense subject matter covered by I Spit on Your Grave, it was marketed like a typical sexploitation film, which led it to be shown in drive-ins, grindhouse theatres and the midnight movie circuit. Seeing a film of this nature in these settings, without the context of Zarchi's feminist intent, trivialises and at worst fetishises sexual violence. Furthermore, there has been a lot of discourse surrounding how effective it is to subvert the male gaze by reclaiming it. As described by Alexandra Helen Nicholas, the rape scenes in I Spit on Your Grave are purposefully framed to make rape sexually titillating. As Zarchi utilised shots commonly associated with pornography such as the money shot, to show the audience the abhorrence of deriving pleasure from a woman's pain. I cannot help but think that using this as an avenue of empowerment is redundant when considering that this film was circulated in grindhouse theatres where people could completely ignore Zarchi's directorial intent. In this case, appropriating the male gaze does not empower women because it submits to the male gaze rather than challenges it. Mimi, I know promising young woman chooses not to show this level of violence. How does this play out in the film? Thanks, Alex. Compared to I Spit on Your Grave, promising young woman's depiction of violence is very different. In fact, there's no physical violence at all, but rather psychological, which I'll touch on in a little bit, but I'll first just provide a brief synopsis of the film. Promising young woman follows a non-victim protagonist, Cassandra Thomas, who enacts revenge on behalf of her best friend, Nina Fisher, who was raped when Nina and Cassie attended medical school. The film begins seven years after the assault. Nina has since committed suicide and is never depicted in the film. Cassie works in a coffee shop after dropping out of med school due to what happened to Nina. She spends her nights pretending to be drunk at bars and clubs, revealing her sobriety to men attempting to take advantage of her. But as the film continues, Cassie's revenge becomes more focused, starting with the people who were bystanders to the assault or those who tried to cover it up, such as the rapist's lawyer, Jordan Green. Finally, at the end of the film, we see Cassie go after the rapist, Al Munro. Throughout the film, Cassie's progression to this final act of revenge isn't linear. Once she runs into an old classmate, Ryan, whom she falls in love with throughout the film, she decides to stop her revenge spree. It is only when it it is revealed to Cassie that Ryan was present during Nina's assault by a video that was given to her by one of her old classmates that she regresses back to her old ways. Cassie targets Al by posing as a stripper at his bachelor party and plans to carve Nina's name into his chest. However, before Cassie can, Al strangles her to death. But in preparation for her death, Cassie has sent Al's old lawyer, Jordan, the video she was given of the assault and asked that if she is killed, he take it to the police. Jordan, who had earned Cassie's trust after expressing his regret for representing Al, does so, and Al is arrested at his wedding for the rape of Nina and murder of Cassie. So Cassie never actually deploys physical violence when she enacts revenge, and I think this is important as it makes the film more accessible to a female viewership. Turn has written in her thesis that the portrayal of female violence in rape revenge films more so represents what men define as justice rather than what females consider justice, and I think Promising Young Woman does a really good job at delivering this sense of female justice. The lack of violence on screen, especially the exclusion of the rape, obviously goes against the more exploitative depictions of violence against women that we see in earlier rape revenge films, but it also allows for Cassie's psychological violence to appear more sinister which allows it to deliver that cathartic sense of justice that is usually achieved through physical violence. In Turner's thesis, she draws on the work of feminist psychologist Carol Gilligan, who is known for her research into female expressions of rage, and highlights how these expressions usually take the form of verbal aggression, passive aggressiveness, or manipulation, because they are more socially acceptable for females than physical violence. Promising Young Woman adopts these more feminine approaches to violence throughout the film when Cassie pretends to be drunk and sees if men will take advantage of her. In one scene, a man invites Cassie back to his apartment. He starts kissing her and unbuttoning her pants, to which she then reveals she is sober. After this revelation, she asks him if he still wants to have sex with her, and he replies, 
No, thank you, ma'am. And she says, they never do. In her thesis on the evolution of the femme castratrice, Walkup points out how Cassie's use of psychological violence stops these men from wanting to perform sexually, leaving them emasculated. While this isn't as physically violent as the male castration scene in I Spit on Your Grave, it feels like a more realistic portrayal of female rage and is able to achieve the cathartic response from at least a female audience that is so crucial to the narrative structure of rape revenge. You want to fuck me still? No, thank you, man. Hmm. No one ever does. What also seems to be unique about this type of violence is that there doesn't need to be as much reliance on the narrative structure for its justification, as in the rape and revenge don't need to compete in terms of ensuring that one isn't too violent for the other. By taking away this need, the genre can focus on allowing social commentary to filter through the films, while also experimenting with non-linear narrative structures. For example, I agree with Warcup's idea that revenge for Cassie isn't so much about violence, but rather exposing those who had a role in Nina's rape and forcing them to take accountability. This obviously reflects a very post hashtag me too understanding of justice. Lastly, Cassie's progression as a femme castratrice doesn't follow the conventional human to animal to monster narrative structure, but rather is non-linear, which shows a more realistic way of dealing with trauma. However, I think where this film falls behind is when we view it through the lens of our first question, Cassie, despite being the protagonist, isn't the victim of the rape. According to Sarah Projansky, a professor in film and gender studies, when rape is avenged by a non-victim protagonist, this takes away the victim's agency. While in Promising Young Woman, Cassie is a female, and this is at least a step above having a male enact revenge on behalf of Nina, Nina is still never present diegetically in the film, and thus, as Shaw states, the narrative becomes about Cassie's problematic internal guilt and psychological obsession with Nina's rape, but not about Nina at all. This also allows Cassie's character to be portrayed as a martyr throughout the film, which Shaw points out is cemented through the religious iconography that is incorporated in the set design. Shaw also links this martyrdom with the way that the film engages with aspects of second wave feminism. This is demonstrated by the way Cassie takes it upon herself to enact Nina's revenge, neglecting the individual nuances of Nina's experience and assuming that what she wants for Nina would be what Nina wants for herself, much like the way sisterhood universalizes female hardship. This also takes away Nina's agency by denying her the right to choose how her trauma is dealt with. Alex, you introduced my film by talking about violence. Do you feel like these films both deliver a sense of justice, even though they have very different types of violence depicted? I think despite offering different approaches, I feel like the sense of justice was not fully delivered by either of these films. The ending of Promising Young Woman left me quite sad and unfulfilled after such an elaborate plan I felt like this more realistic ending in comparison really fell short. Um, but I also feel like in I Spit on Your Grave, the same is also true. I built up a lot of momentum while watching Jennifer carry out her murders, but then the film just ended. Her entire development was consumed by her revenge and we didn't get to see her evolve past that. Yeah, well, I feel like with the um, the way that um, Cassie dies at the end, I read that it's supposed to be like, this the way that like women are in this patriarchal world and they can't enact revenge because like it's not like they it's not their space to because like realistically they like can't so like the way that she dies is because they're like well in this world like women can't like go through those like plans of violence yeah i found the end quite harrowing like the director was saying like hang on women can try and combat this but like ultimately they will die at the end like I found yeah. that so depressing I was very sad when she died like I was ready for her to like it was also such a brutal out. death yeah the strangulation like, scene is so like it was so long I wasn't expecting that it just <laughs> held on it and I was waiting for her to you know, escape promising young woman being that kind of being quite purposely unfulfilling uh, in the justice it kind of tries to reach do you think that there's maybe a difference between uh something that's satisfying as justice to the audience and something that fulfill that feels fulfilling in terms of the punishment towards the antagonists yeah i think so i think that there's definitely a difference because when well in i spit in the grave when she murdered these men i didn't feel sorry for any of the men who she murdered i felt like it was warranted in a way, but I wasn't fulfilled by that alone. I needed something more than that. And so I think 
yeah, but the, the catharsis of the murder was not enough for me to feel like justice was delivered. Mm. Like, you want to know if she's okay. Yeah. Yeah, like, mm. publish that book, girly. Go back to New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like I get the same, this, like, sense of catharsis, though, from, like, Cassie's psychological violence, though. Like, especially in the first scene, even though you don't know why she's doing what she's doing, when she, like, walks out and she's eating that hot dog and, like, the blood's dripping mm. down her, like, arm, she, you're like, yeah, like, slow. Like, the she looks very strong. Lawyer. Yeah. It was, like really effective Mm. and you don't need to know why she's doing it no at that point we don't know So Revenge is an English-French action thriller directed and written by uh, Coralie Fargate made in 2017 starring Matilda Lutz Kevin Janssens Vincent Colomb and uh, Guillermo Bashid Uh, The story follows Jen, an American woman who is having an affair with her married neighbour, Richard. Richard flies them out by helicopter to a secluded home in the middle of the desert before his annual hunting trip with Dimitri and Stan, but they unfortunately arrive early. Morning after a night of drinking and dancing, Stan tries to initiate sex with Jen, but she refuses, to which he subsequently rapes her while Dimitri ignores her cries from the other room by turning the volume up on the television to drown out her crying. Upon coming home, Richard finds out what's happened to Jen and decides to bribe her to be quiet about the whole thing, but she threatens to expose their affair and is outraged by the lack of support from Richard. Richard, Dimitri and Stan subsequently attempt to kill Jen by pushing her off a cliff and impaling her on a tree. Miraculously surviving, however, Jen heals herself and decides to enact revenge on the three men one by one, killing them in hyper-stylized and over-the-top violence. The film was released a few months after the allegations of Weinstein came to light and the Mean Too movement began gaining momentum. It was met with much critical acclaim and particular praise for its depictions of manipulation, passive participation in sexual assault, as well as its reflection of the male gaze and voyeuristic attitudes, given the film largely deals with gender and power dynamics. So what does the film contribute to the rape-revenge narratives? Well, structurally, revenge follows many traditional beats and movements of rape-revenge films from the 1970s. McWilliams and Bickle identify the narratives as largely consisting of three universal beats – The first act consisting of the protagonist being sexually assaulted. The second is the recovery and transformation from victim to avenger. And the third consisting of revenge in the form of castration, rape, or murder to their attacker. Lance furthers this too in a more general manner, stating the rape-revenge structure is largely the movement from being the object of violence, or in other words, the victim, to being its subject, or simply put, the aggressor. It does little to innovate this actual structure as Jen follows these beats as Fagit professes that it's a story we all know well and it's meant to feel familiar for it, meaning the film homages and odes itself to its earlier rape-revenge predecessors. She even goes as far to use imagery of a phoenix beer can uh, Jen uses to cauterize her wound as she metaphorically rises from the ashes to become the avenger of her assault. Fagit does exploit the female body in the first act, using several point-of-view shots from Stan's binoculars, watching Jen as she danced to literally demonstrate the voyeurism at play, but this is of course cleverly reversed through though once Jen becomes the hunter in the third act. So if revenge doesn't structurally innovate or change, what does it add and what makes it so different? Well, there are two elements. Firstly, its representation of a victim in contemporary society, and secondly is its depiction of justice and revenge. Jen is not your traditional protagonist and victim of rape revenge. She is immediately hypersexualized and shown to embrace her sex and body with confidence, as Fagit gives us several dancing montages to her with electronic music and low-angle close-ups of her body, completely reflecting the male gaze. A more traditional protagonist from rape revenge films is seen as innocent and the violation of her sexuality is a destruction and a robbing of her agency. While Jen is definitely robbed of her agency, Bagheet makes it some- feel like something that is rather exploited and betrayed. This becomes clear with Richard gaslighting her, stating you're so beautiful it's hard to resist you, as though that becomes reasoning and an excuse for the sexual assault. Another aspect is the hyper-fantasy of revenge. Bagheet admits this as the film contains elements of fantasy almost and unrealistically over-the-top violence. While the frequent violence for some might be off-putting and distancing, Fagit finds it a way to ground it enough to never seem distracting and always feel purposeful through its symbolic value and purpose. For example, there are effectively four moments of intense violence, the attempted murder and revival of Jen and the deaths of Dimitri, Stan and Richard. Jen should very clearly die, but by having this excessive impalement, Fagit shows that she can survive more and survive anything. Her assault does not dictate her and conveys her strength purely through its fantasy. Dimitri is stabbed in the eye to symbolically show that he turned a blind eye to to her rape. 
Jen also maims Stan when he steps on broken glass she laid as a trap for him, a reversal of how Stan used the glass to trap and assault Jen. Once Richard is shot at the end, he bleeds an incredibly large amount of blood, in part, as Fargy puts it, to extend his slow bleeding out and to truly savour Jen's moment of revenge. The whole film hyperbolizes the aspect of revenge, so much so that it's solely the film's title, The Selling of Pure Revenge. This becomes interesting when we consider Walker's theory on horror films becoming aspects of activism, which is particularly important and applicable to contemporary rape revenge films like Revenge. Walker labels that films nowadays, due to the increase in socio-political awareness and global interconnectivity, will, whether they intend to or not, be saying something meaningful, thus modern mainstream media needs to be aware that it stands as a form of activism. We can make this connection to Clover's point as well, when she said the rise of rape revenge coincided with rape being taken more seriously as a social issue. It's not an accident that the film's timely release was delayed just slightly to coincide with the Me Too politics, and Fargate herself went on interview, admitting that she was not surprised with the many releases of allegations and found solace in her film being viewed as an important aspect and commentary on the power dynamics at play in Hollywood. Matilda Lutz's portrayal of Jen ultimately shows how in the 21st century these issues of sexual assault are not foreign and are still not excusable no matter the moral character of the victim. The issues still pertain and by Fargate presenting Jen as a promiscuous woman and introducing her with moral ambiguity surrounding her affair, we realise today that sexual assault is never okay, thus revenge stands to become activist horror film in contemporary society and adhere to Walker's rule. This lighter tone also assists in this. Cinematographer Robert Hayer highlights the orange and blue sky of the desert, almost looking similarly to Mad Max and the consistent use of electronic music and consistent cuts and use of diegetic sound, like the television commercials, simultaneously distract the realism at the moment, but stylize it in a way that further creates it as fantasy, again supported by the excessive violence. It makes the film ultimately accessible and plays its meaning in a nuanced and subtle way. So, Cecily, similar to Violation, both Jen and Miriam are both presented as morally ambiguous characters and are introduced initially as anti-heroes of their own story. What do you think the effect of having a rape revenge protagonist that is not morally perfect is? I think it's great in revenge that the victim is modern. She's got sexual agency, which is realistic to the time period we are in now. This notion of an anti-hero asks the audience to consider the fact that women do not have to be perfect and sexually naive to be worthy of sympathy when they are assaulted and I think that's true in Violation as well. I'll be looking at the 2020 film Violation, a film one of the co-directors describes as an anti-revenge film. Made in Canada in the post Me Too era, it provides a fascinating character study of a victim of sexual assault and the process of demoralisation which comes with revenge. The film follows a troubled woman on the brink of divorce who travels home to visit her estranged sister in her house in the woods. What follows is a sexual assault, a process of gaslighting, and a subsequent revenge against her attacker. But the revenge is chilling and brutal, never providing the sense of closure that she craves. When I was starting to think about our primary questions around dominant viewpoints on victims and narrative structures' roles in shaping the victim, the film offers a counterpoint to the mainstream rape revenge. The film utilises non-linear disorientation with use of non-chronological narrative reframes the victim and the victim's trauma, a disorientation reminiscent of post-traumatic stress disorder. The narrative structure allows to show triggers that pull you back to a specific moment as the audience is situated within the victim's viewpoint. At first, while looking at film scholar and feminist critic Sarah Projansky, she said, One cannot fully understand cinema itself without addressing rape and its representation. At first I thought this was a very extreme take, prioritising rape over all other extremity. But maybe in our cultural discourse it is the most ultimate evil to portray on screen. Although in reference to television, Geyser's dissertation fascinatingly addresses the ultimate fallacy of the rape revenge, the notion that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I think we see this idea a lot in cinema, where a woman must go through trauma to be a compelling character. Sexual violence is built into plot lines, genre, and even cinema's legacy itself. So maybe women do need to be abused to be powerful, like a hero's journey. Maybe violence against women is a necessary plot device, or narrative thread, or tether. I'd like to think we can challenge these notions. She discusses the pervasive myth that someone cannot be assaulted by a partner Consent can be measured by physical passivity 
or enacting revenge on a rapist relieves the survivor of any post-traumatic stress from the attack. I'll talk about the last point later, but I would say that violation undercuts these notions in a myriad of ways. Firstly, the creative decision by Madeline Sims Fewer and Dusty Mansicelli to make the rapist some t- someone close to the victim subverts prevailing cinematic representations of rape. He is a brother-in-law, not some stranger in an alleyway, some man in the forest pushing her face in the mud. He knows her, and this makes the implications even more severe and realistic. Secondly, in the assault scene itself, Marianne is initially asleep. Once realising what is being done to her, she reverts to the freeze response, a common reaction to sexual assault which is largely ignored in rape revenge films. In her preface, Ella Nicholas discusses confusion on what sexual violence is and how rape revenge films offer a contemporary example. She argues that contradictory and often hypocritical attitudes can coexist generally. I interpreted this as a statement on the cultural confusion about what rape is and how cinema can both help and hinder society's views around it. Prochansky interestingly points out that paradoxically even texts that explicitly articulate an anti-rape perspective can also inadvertently contribute to these backlash representations. I think this applies to all of our films and violation with the film being initially banned in Australia. I think one of her most interesting takes is the feminist paradox in which she describes the desire to end rape and the need to represent it. I feel like I have grappled with this as a lover of exploitation cinema and the horror genre. Rape revenge films enable conversations around power dynamics and retaliation. It would be impossible, if not reductive, for them not to exist at all. What struck me the most about Violation was that there was more visceral suffering shown in the revenge than the rape itself. The revenge subverts what the victim can achieve through the act of revenge. It's not a cathartic, feminist, embodied experience with a good-for-her moment at the end. It is messy, yet methodical, vicious, painful, and disgusting. She is not a crusader. She goes on a path of destroying herself. The systematic nature of hanging her assaulter's body to drain his blood into a mundane esky. The vomiting on the black tarp with the bottles of bleach and flame. The film abandons traditional catharsis and ventures into outright disgust. The audience does not feel released in her revenge, rather questioning the moral degradation that comes as the natural progression from violence. Violation undercuts Bajansi's notion that rape is a transformative act, which allows a woman to go from meek into a powerful, independent woman who protects herself and sometimes her friends and family, or rather, soft victims to hard avengers. Even in moments of dismemberment, everything she does is an act of destruction, eroding at her own morality. Marianne's pain creeps up on you as if it is your own, yet aesthetically the film does not prioritise female suffering. Her revenge is not a purge, but a muddying of the waters, evolving false parades of feminism in a lot of rape revenges. There is no triumph or fantasy, just an unleashing of repulsion. The non-linear structure of the film places the viewer within Marion's POV, yet in the assault itself it is objective. This objective POV situates the viewer to take away what, as what they are seeing as an absolute truth. Use of extreme close-ups on bugs, fire and wolves alludes to the naturality of sexual violence. Golden light from the fire diminishes to a melancholic blue to an extreme close-up of the eyes of a wooden figure. Haunting operatic music begins with the non-diegetic fire crackle. There is an inherent sense of dread and foreboding. The camera lingers too close in every shot to fully make out what you are watching. What appears to be clothes being pulled off, a lifeless hand and hollowed out eyes. It is not violent. She is not half-dressed, screaming for the male gaze to enjoy. She merely whimpers, don't, and stop, which her assaulter seems to interpret as don't stop and uses it to gaslight her after the event. Finally, the film's refusal to sexualize Marianne, juxtaposed with the confronting the audience with graphic male nudity, is just another way the film undercuts the rape revenge. We never see her exposed or nude, yet in the revenge we see a man fully naked with an erect penis begging for his life. The final image of the party guests eating ice cream with crushed up bones in it taints any purification you may get from her revenge. 
Violation lacks the over-the-top violence of revenge or the candy-coloured dark comedy and promising young woman. Instead, it sits in a perpetual state of dread. So Marian is not a perfect victim. Does that change how empathetically we feel towards her, do you think? Personally, it didn't change how I felt empathetically towards her, but I did feel like I needed to work harder in the beginning to understand. Because at first, before we get the context of what has actually happened, I felt really angry towards her. I felt sorry for her sister. And it was just, I think it's more of a complex relationship. But then as you start seeing her internal grief and how much she's struggling, you I've just felt like I felt almost even more sympathy for her because it really felt like this was someone I was going on an emotional journey with and it was complex and there were so many layers to it. Yeah, for sure. I felt like uh, with Violation specifically, the kind of non-chronological ordering of the story initially had me very, very empathetic and not really seeing her that much as an anti-hero. I saw her as quite a a typical protagonist, but the more it revealed uh, and it's... It, it's kind of choice between sequences and scenes. It started to reveal her kind of anti heroness and ambiguity more as it went on. So by the end of the film, you kind of perfectly got that message of anti-revenge. Yeah, the first cut they did of the film was like proper chronological order and they felt that it wasn't like anti-revenge enough. So then they yeah. changed it to non-chronological. I definitely think the non-linear like works. I feel like if it was in order... Yeah, I just feel like it wouldn't have as much nuance. And I feel like it wouldn't push you to think about things in different ways. Like, it would just kind of be presented to you. And you'd be like, yeah, then you're gay. Yeah, like, you wouldn't see her, like, going, like, crying and going through all that before she does all the horrible things to him. Do you think that the graphic male nudity dismantles a rape revenge in some sort of way? With um, Violation, like, it feels very deliberate and I feel like they've, like, they've, like, really committed to that yeah. idea of male nudity. Whereas in Revenge, it's kind of, like, I feel like they don't commit. Like, I feel like it's always, like, a back shot. Like, you see the back mm-hmm. of him and yeah. he's kind of running around. And he, like, looks very, like, like, you feel, like, in a position of, like, like, he looks like a victim. Like, he looks kind of weak and, like, you kind of watching him scramble around and it's, like, Ugh. But, like, I feel like it isn't committing to the same yeah, like, like, he's, like, vulnerable, but in violation, I guess the title, but he, he like, it seems very violating because mm. he's, like, fully, like, strapped to the chair and stuff. It, it mm. feels a lot more perverse, I think, in violation to me. But um, it feels so unsexual to me in violation. Yeah. Well, it feels unsexual, but then, like, he obviously has an erection. Like, it's erection, so it's interesting how, like, from the male, like, from his viewpoint, yeah, it's extremely sexual. I'm, I'm not sure if it was just me, but did anyone else... Um, like, suspect that that was going to happen, that she was going to knock him out. When that, when that no, I thought it was going to go on a little longer. I oh, thought she was yeah. going to, like, tease him. Yeah, I thought maybe off. she was going to chop his dick off. Yeah. yeah. So that's, like, kind of a classic rape revenge trope. As yeah, we've I seen spit on your girl. Yeah. Um, but she thought something was going to go wrong for him, right? Well, it was hard to tell because I already knew. I oh, like I could try to think about whether like if I didn't know it was a right event film if I would have been watching it and been like, mm, this is a bit of a weird sex scene, but okay. Like things feel tense. Yeah. But if you like but I knew what the film was about, so I obviously knew that like why it was tense. No, yeah, when the fe- the scene first started, I did think they were just gonna have like consensual sex. Right. So I didn't know that because I knew it was gonna I like I didn't I knew think it was that a rape I knew it was gonna be. But oh, I, but like, did you think maybe the rape right. was gonna happen in that scene? Well, I can't even remember what was my viewpoint, but I literally didn't read anything about it until I watched it. The only thing that I'd seen beforehand was that um, I think it said that, yeah, it said that it was her uh, brother in law. The synopsis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It says and it said so that, that, with that knowledge kind of going in, and when he started to kind of get fully nude, I was immediately like thinking, oh, something, he's going to get, um, like, he's going to get something happened to them because yeah. they kind of imply that something beforehand had happened when they were um, in the tent or when they were camping. And I thought mm-hmm. that having him nude in there for so long became very, very eerie and it became kind of like uh, it felt 
it felt very like uncomfortable, but not because he was new, but more because like oh something was gonna happen to him. Mm. Yeah, it had um, like a sinister energy. Yeah, had a, to it. yeah, that's the way to put it. Yeah. I have a question because I didn't watch the entire scene. Is he naked the entire time? Or then they start doing... Like, I know he'd be naked, but do they show everything the entire time? Or do they start doing shots that are just, of, like, his torso up? Or... Well, they... She, like, tries to strangle him with the bag and he's still naked, but then she backs out of it last minute and then he attacks her and he's, like, fully nude for that. But, yeah, and when she hangs him and is draining his blood out you see his like non-erect penis how do they do that by the way just out of curiosity the cut uh, the cutting yeah they just was made, that him or was that... they made a mold of yeah. just um like the bottom half of his body right okay. oh, it looks like really good i'll be honest yeah it wasn't a massive yeah. budget it's i think it was really kind of like about that anti-revenge part like the way it held on to some of the shots for a really really long time like when she when she drained the body um, yeah and when when he's kind of sitting there and uh, she's gonna hit him over the head. The the fact that it kind of holds on to those angles, or when she's cutting on the leg as well, yeah. and it's just a slow pan out. Um, I yeah. think it kind of all helps really build the sinister, the sinister tone of it all. Yeah, when he's like strapped on the chair and like suffocating in the bag, and you just hear like the chair on the wooden floor, and it went on for that like little bit too long. Mm. I found that like really yeah. uncomfortable. So, what film do we feel yeah. most effectively represents an accurate depiction of victimhood and violence? I think we want to say Violation, Cecily, your film. It's a very realistic portrayal of, like, grief. I think a lot of the other films don't really depict it. I think Promising Young Woman does a good, a slightly good job of depicting, like, how a friend might react. Yeah. But obviously not the same as, like, a victim. I think Promising Young Woman is good with the violence because it's, like, as you said before, like, psychological. Like, um. And it's like a gendered stereotype, but often women will seek revenge in psychological ways. So when she like, you know, manipulates the lawyer and stuff, I feel like that is very effective. Yeah, I think for promising young women, I found it really hard to like, yeah, think about it as a gen like a stereotype or more like like or subverting the stereotype, like stereotype because like yeah, like the line between what's realistic and then what is kind of a stereotype. I think something that Violation did that. I think more accurately portrays victimhood compared to I Spit on Your Grave was seeing, as Mimi was saying, that grief and seeing someone really grappling with the things that they're doing. Um, I think you even mentioned before, Cecily, that scene where she goes to strangle him with the plastic bag and then she rips it off because she genuinely just couldn't go through with it at that moment. And I feel like that's probably a more realistic and human response is that when awful things happen to you, you're not, you don't always go into this full fight mode where you just lose all empathy and all consciousness of what you're doing, which is something that definitely Jennifer did and I spit on your grave. And I just think that that was far more realistic and but also was much harder to watch because you couldn't sort of indulge in this fantasy you were having to watch someone who is struggling someone who's in pain and someone who's doing something that is probably going to cause them more pain in the long run mm. it's yeah. kind of like the fight or flight um, <laughs> thing you were talking about with it yeah right? yeah and like the freeze i think is like something i've always struggled with rape revenge because like the most common reaction to being assaulted is just freezing and saying nothing and then obviously yeah. that's used against people but it doesn't seem natural that you want to just like violently yeah. stab the guy <laughs> after like yeah and i feel like that before we started this project or like when we were thinking of an idea or like what i was interested in was like this idea that like how you, like i think there's a place in the films and like you get some enjoyment out of them like you said you like exploitation films but like it feels like it just so a lot of the time feels like it's not like a way a female would do something like it just feels so masculine in that way of like getting revenge like violence like it just doesn't feel like an accurate depiction of like what someone would want to do after an assault whereas I feel like violation like kind of marries that idea of like women are still capable of being violent but like this is actually what someone would feel while doing so. The other part that I kind of found uh, particularly good in Violation, uh, but it was interesting that all the 
uh, post Me Too uh, films uh, did was they really kind of depict kind of a sense of gaslighting and a sense of kind of mental manipulation over uh, the victim. And so in Promising Young Woman, it's uh, a lot of you know, the protagonist trying to um, trying to share her friend's truth and her friend's story and perspective uh, versus, you know, people that are going to be professional skeptics on it, uh, like the lawyer, like the judge dean? of the... Yeah, the dean, thank you, yeah. Uh, and so you're, you're kind of constantly... Uh, it's each one of the protagonists from those films faces some kind of level of, of just... Uh, denial from the antagonists uh, in revenge, like they kind of blame it on her. But you had to put up a fight. Women always have to put up a fucking fight. And I think Violation was uh, particularly interesting where she's asking, like, oh, yeah, so did you think about that night? And he said, yeah, you said don't stop. And then when you see the moment again later, you see that she said, like, don't. And it was a very, very clear difference in interpretation. And it was just this complete, like, uh, lack of... Uh, it's they, they don't even say the word rape at any point, which I thought was uh, really, really interesting. Um, I think that's what's also, like, hollow about I Spin in Your Grave. Because she, like, tries to call, I'm assuming, the police. But she never really, like, tells anyone, you know? Yeah. She's not, like... She doesn't have a friend there. She doesn't have... A husband or someone to be like I was raped like it's just like she goes on this revenge like herself mm. but it's also like there was no one there was no denial of what happened to her not, yeah. not that it makes that justifies anything but <laughs> I think yeah I guess that's like how the genre has like grown and changed and like look into these nuances especially post me too with like gaslighting being such a hot word mm. it's like obviously a real thing mm. And, and a lot of our films as well, so the more recent ones, they really try to uh, shy away from not showing you the physical act of sexual assault as well. Mm. And I think uh, it was much more about indulging in the revenge aspects, which was quite interesting. So in violation with those very, um, very, very like intense close-ups and everything being quite out of focus, you could hear what was going on. And the same in re- revenge, you could hear what was happening so it allowed you to think about it and kind of construct the same kind of horror that it it really you know is trying to show you. But um, ultimately, like especially violation, it was holding way more into the process of revenge and, and how disgusting and hard that was for her as well, uh, which I found quite cool. A tiny bit of I spit on your grave. I swear that is the actual revenge because there's like one assault and then there's like two more, and you're like an hour and a half in, and you're like. Okay, where's the revenge? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And like the speedboat when she kills two people at once and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, drag that two, out. Yeah, drag <laughs> that out. Don't hit two birds with one stone. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. And also like even just the rape sequences were so much more intense and so much more graphic and hard to watch than the actual murders themselves. Yeah, her like screams were like, so primal. Oh God. Like, yeah. It was really, that was so much harder to watch than the actual murders, but that wasn't because, you know, it was that catharsis of watching the murder and, like, you know, almost, like, you know, not enjoying, but, like... Like, you weren't sitting at the edge of your seat, like, anticipation. No, it wasn't any of that. It was just, like, this is not treated in the same way Mm. as the rape scenes were. It's just not framed I think, with the same intent. And Mm. I think it it definitely is a drawback of the film now, I think, looking at it from a post-Me Too perspective. I'm glad that that's sort of something that's been left in the past. Yeah, Um, I haven't seen the remake. Yeah, no, I love it. Apparently they call the police in the remake. Oh, well, there's heaps of remakes. Yeah. But the one that I was reading about, like, they call the police. She calls the police, but then, like, he's in on it, and it's, like, horrible. From what I've heard is that the murders in the remakes are more brutal than the actual assault. Yeah. So they've changed that. So. Mm. And yeah, I think I can see why they've changed that. If we look at the you know, caliber of rape films now and what we're seeing now, it makes more sense that I spit on your grave would 
move with the times, mm. I guess. Yeah, I guess that marks like the big narrative shift. Yeah. Like which one <laughs> you prioritize because they're equally horrible things to do to other people. Mm-hmm. But it's really how you narratively frame it, which makes the audience feel one way or the other. Mm. Yes. And it's also interesting because I found that with Promising Young Woman, I think the kind of idea of justice and trying to, like, for that to happen, it wasn't violent. There was nothing hard to watch about, uh, I guess, like, the aspects of revenge in Promising Young Woman. And I'd argue that revenge, while it was incredibly violent, it, it actually, it was, the whole film was set up as an action thriller more than a story yeah. of trauma. And it was more about... Um, yeah, it felt fun. It, yeah, yeah, it, it was it, easy it, to... It was just so over the top. Yeah, it like was... Like, watching it, it and you're like, oh. like yeah. it's just easy to watch. Yeah, whereas the, the, the revenge and violation was really uncomfortable. That yeah. was... Um, and that was still very, very violent, but it felt... Uh, that's the only film where I felt like the, the revenge aspect of it was difficult to watch, um, yeah. or the most difficult to watch. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the I Spit on Your Great Revenge film podcast. Today, we have analysed the films I Spit on Your Grave, Promising Young Woman, Revenge and Violation. We hope you have enjoyed our commentary and learnt a little bit more about depictions of victimhood and violence in great revenge films. Keep a lookout for our future episodes coming to you soon.